Topic 4.2 Microscopic Examination or Metallography In order to reveal the microstructure of metallic parts, there are several steps to do so, starting from cutting and mounting, then grinding, polishing, etching, and examination of the microstructure. So in the first step, cutting and mounting. As you can see from the picture here, the sample is cut and mounted to facilitate smooth surface. And that is because the microstructure is very small. We can't see it by our naked eyes. And therefore, we need to prepare the sample surface that is suitable to be revealed under the microscope. First, we need to cut that metal part into small pieces and then mount by using bakelite. As you can see from the black bits over here surrounding the metallic part that we want to investigate. And it is important that the surface has to be smooth for the next step of metallographic preparation on the grinding and polishing. The grinding is first carried out by using abrasive papers or the sand papers and by the action of grinding machine. As you can see from this picture, very deep scratches thin from the cutting process can be removed, leaving just the fine scratches to be get rid of in the next step of polishing. So in polishing step, we use cloths with abrasive media to finally remove all the remaining scratches left on the metal surface. We can also use the automatic grinding and polishing machine as you can see from this picture. Then we can program the speed, the force to put onto the sample and also the timing. That would be appropriate for each metallic part. Then to the next step, the polished sample is then etched by using etchant. For example, the acid solution that is to give chemical attack onto the grain boundaries. In order to reveal the microstructure of the metallic part under the optical microscope in the final step of examination. So to reveal the metal grain, we normally use the optical microscope. As you can see here that we put the prepared sample onto the stage underneath the optical lenses. So in the final step, we examine the metal surface under the optical microscope to reveal the microstructure. So for summary, metallography includes cutting and mounting. Then the next step is the grinding and polishing, followed by etching and examination on the microscope. I would like to go to a little details on each step. First on grinding and polishing. The picture you see on your right hand side here are the examples of emerald paper or sandpaper that contains abrasive particles that can remove small layers of metal surface bit by bit. They come with different sizes of the abrasive particles as you can see over here. According to the grid size, the size of the abrasive particles on the sandpaper can be classified as the grid size according to its diameter. For example, P120 grid size means that the brassy particles having the diameter of about 125 micron. And as we increase the grid size to 240, 400, 800, or even 1200, the brassy particle size reduces from 125 micron down to 15.3 micron. So, the greater the grid size, the smaller the diameter of the abrasive particles, and so the smoother the surface of the metal can be achieved. And in action, we can grind and polish the sample surface manually by pressing the sample surface onto the sandpaper that is going in a circular motion according to the speed that we can set up over here and normally starting from 200 rpm. It is convenient to do the metal surface grinding with water, that the water would help to lubricate between the surface of the metal and the sandpaper, and also to remove the cutting bits out from the interface that can improve the grinding efficiency and lower the heat generating on the metal surface itself. I would like to give you a little bit of illustration here when the hard abrasive particle, as you can see from the purple grain here, can remove the metal surface bits by bits. Imagine that down over here is the metal bulb near the surface. And by the motion of the abrasive paper to the left, for example, 
the sharp tip of the hot abrasive grain can curl off the metal surface out as the small chips. So the bigger the hard abrasive grain, the deeper the metal surface can be cut off or ground off. And therefore on the grinding step, we have to start with smaller grid size and then increasing the grid size to gradually remove the scratches from step by step to get the smoother surface, as I will show you how. The picture you can see over here showing scratches that is obtained by using the sandpaper having 120 grit size. So the surface is quite rough because we're starting from lower number of grit size. On grinding, we have to increase the grit size to obtain smoother surface. And as we start from 120 grit size, to go to the further step, we have to increase the grit size and also we have to change the grinding direction if we do it by hand to be at the right angle according to the previous grinding step. So every time we change the grid size, we have to change the direction of our grinding. So we know that the previous stretches have been completely removed. So then we're moving on to the next step of grinding at 320 grit, 400 and then 600. We can also go for 800, 1000 and 1200 grit size in order to get a smoother surface. And finally, when we arrive at polishing step, it is to remove the fine scratches that remain on the metal surface by using polishing cloth instead of the sandpaper. And now we have to apply the grinding media in the form of colloidal suspension. For example, fine alumina for acidic condition or silica for alkaline condition or even using diamond colloidal suspension that the last one is more expensive. After polishing, we will obtain the surface looking like this. From this, all the deeper scratches have all been completely removed. But there might be some very fine scratches left on the surface. And here, because we're using pre-micron alumina, and if we want to get much finer surface without scratches, we might have to use the abrasive media that contain even finer alumina, like 1 micron or 0.5 micron, for example. But then we need a longer step of metallographic preparation. So with the increasing steps and time consuming, for a very fine polishing step like this that have to use the alumina size of less than 1 micron will be suitable just for specific condition. After the polishing step that we obtained a very smooth surface, now we come to the next step of etching. As you know that metal can be attacked by chemicals, but some are quite selective. So you have to select suitable etching that can be used to reveal the grain boundaries of particular metals and alloys. And to do so, safety is the prime requirement. You have to use the thumb in order to immerse the metal sample into the solution or the etching for a certain period of time. And this has to be done in the film hood or the film cupboard for your own safety, like you can see from this picture. After it, you have to rinse the metal sample under running water and then alcohol and finally air drying to remove all the moisture that can be remain on the metal surface. Then, the metallographic preparation for metallic sample is done and now ready for microstructure examination in the next step. In order to examine the microstructure of metals, we normally use the optical microscope. As you can see from the picture on your right hand side, and this might be one that you get a chance to use when you were at school. Here's the eyepiece and the arm. Over here is the base, the light source, and the stage that we will put the prepared sample on. Up here are the optical lenses, and that might come in three or four magnifications, and all are controlled by the revolving nose piece over here. Other than that, Here's our, the coarse and the fine adjustment, and down here is the light nerve. I hope that you can recall all this. So the concept of the light or the optical microscope is very simple. Remember, when we etch the metal surface, only the grain boundaries are etched 
and appear as the rough surface, whereas the grain interiors stay very smooth. And therefore, the rough grain boundaries will reflect the light away and then appear dark when we see under the optical microscope. On the other hand, the smooth grain interiors will reflect the light back to the objective lens or the optical lens and then appears bright. By looking at this diagram, you will see how the grain boundaries and the grain interiors reflect the light. Up here is the microscope or the lens. When the light comes down onto the grain interior, since the surface is smooth, then it will reflect the light back to the microscope or the lens. And therefore, this area will appear bright. On the other hand, when the light comes down to reflect on the grain boundaries, since it is the rough surface, it then reflects the light away. And the area at the grain boundaries will then appear dark. And now you can see the effect of etching on how the microstructure of metal is revealed under the microscope. If we start over here on the metal surface without etching, picture on the top showing the cross-section view of the metal surface over here. And once the incident light comes down reaching on the polished metal surface, with a smooth surface, it then reflects the light. And we can see the bright surface under the optical microscope. And now, if the metal surface has been etched, there appears the grain boundaries that has been etched away, leaving the metal grain interior remain smooth. So, when the incident light coming down to reach on the etched metal surface, the smooth surface of grain interiors will reflect the light, but some at the grain boundaries containing rough surfaces reflect the light away in this direction. Therefore, the lost reflections of light in this case that will result in the dark area along the grain boundaries. So that's why we can see the grain boundaries appear darker than the grain interior. And if we etch the metal surface even longer, in this case, the etched grain appear darker as you can see over here. That result in more loss of reflections of light. So for metallography, we have to etch the sample in a proper period of time in order to reveal the grain boundaries and to be careful that not to etch the metal surface too much or we may lose some important information of the grain structures. I would like to show you different microstructures of metal that have been produced by casting or metalworking that will give a wide variety of grain structures First, if you look at this picture, it is the drain right that you can find in the cast structure. This picture is taken under optical microscope, and this is the cross section of the drain right that you can be thinking of the snowflake in three dimensional. Next is the columnar grains that can be observed also in the cast structure. And whilst we pouring the molten mat into the side of the mold, First, the grain nucleated along the wall of the mold as the heat extraction. And open solidification, the grain grows in the direction towards the center as opposed to the heat extraction direction. And this results in the columnar grains like this. Other examples are the ductile cast iron and the gray cast iron. In the ductile cast iron, you can notice the globular or nodule graphite surrounded by the ferrite face that appears white within the perlite metric that appears darker. And for the grey cast iron, the graphite now changed its shape into the flake-like, and all the graphite flakes are distributed in the perlite matrix with some areas of ledabolite. So with this different microstructure, the ductile cast iron and the grey cast iron therefore have different mechanical properties and are normally used in different purposes. The ductile cast iron with nodular graphite normally has higher strength and ductility, so it's normally used for the application that the component has to bear a greater level of load. And for the grey cast iron, it is easier to produce and cheaper. But as the graphite is in the flake form, the ductility and the strength is not as good as one that we obtain from the ductile cast iron. So the grey cast iron is normally used where the strength and ductility are not critical. 
Next examples are the microstructure that has been processed under working condition, or we can call it the verb structure. The first example that you can see over here is in Cornell 718. And for this type of the alloy, we can see very clearly on the grain boundaries. And here there are some features called twin bands. And the twin band is quite a characteristic of this type of alloy. And it happens after the alloy has been mechanically formed, followed by annealing. And hence, this feature is also called annealing twins. And next is the cold worked steel. And from this picture, the steel has been rolled in this working direction. As you can see from the alignment of the particles and the grain structure. The cold work structure is normally strong, giving high strength to the metal component. And this, when you look at the microstructure in two-dimensional under the optical microscope. But sometimes we try to construct the 3D model to look at the grain orientation by looking at this picture showing the structure of a dual-phase steel constructed in three dimensions. The first one showing in red is the martin side face, and the white area is the ferrite. And this construction shows the uniformity of the microstructure in all directions. As you see from the picture towards the right hand side over here, the more variation of colors towards red, green, and blue will give uniform grain orientations. That is to show that the whole microstructure is uniform with isotropic properties. That means the steel will show similar properties in all three dimensions. On the other hand, pictures on your right hand side showing structural and isotropy of a duplex stellar steel that has been deformed in a very severe condition. As you can see over here, appears in blue is the ferrite grain, appears in red is the austenite grain. And by looking at this picture to the right showing parallel grains of austenite and ferrite, and therefore this type of microstructure show an isotropic properties as we can notice down here. But if the color over here is dominated by just one color, like it's looking like more green in this case, so they are preferred orientation. That is, the grains are likely to orientate towards particular direction. And therefore, we have to be careful whenever using the metal components having an isotropic properties like this. And from this, you can see how we get the information from studying the grain structure. There are plenty of useful information, isn't it? So now, let's move on to another technique that we use to examine the microstructure. It is the Scanning Electron Microscope or SEM. This picture showing the SEM unit that we have in our university. And the concept of Scanning Electron Microscope is quite different from the optical microscope as the source of energy is not from the light. But in the case of SEM, we now have the electron as the energy source. On this diagram on picture A, the electron gun on the top here will emit the electron through the anode down to the cathode, which is the conductive sample, once we apply very high voltage. And once the electron is emitted from the electron gun, the electron beam will go through the anode, passing through the magnetic lens and the scanning coil, and finally to focus onto the sample surface. And if we enlarge this area, as we can see in picture B, down here is the sample surface. And once the electron beam comes hitting down on the metal surface, there will be different types of interaction to produce secondary electrons or backscattered electrons or even X-rays or J electrons. However, in this technique, we use the detector lying down next to the sample surface over here to collect the signals obtained from the secondary electron that will be used for the construction of the image. And here we have the image obtained from the SEM or scanning electron microscope. And this is the SEM image of the steel containing 0.3% carbon. And therefore appear dark over here is the ferrite grain. And in the rougher area of the lamella structure here is the perlite. And as I have explained that once the electron beam hitting on the metal surface, there are a variety of interactions taking place. 
Once the electron beam hitting on the sample surface, all the smoke passing through as the transmitted electron, but some with lower energy, giving different interaction as you can see over here, to give out different signals. And for the construction of the SEM image, we require the secondary electron that we can pick up the signal just near the surface of the sample. So the principle of SEM is that on the rough surface, once the electron beam hitting on the surface, it will produce very high signal. And then the detector will collect a lot of signals that will construct as the bright image. By looking over here, the politic microstructure appears like a very rough surface and therefore it appears lighter under the SEM. On the other hand, for the smooth surface like one over here, for the ferrite grain, once the electron beam hitting on the smooth surface, so lower signals are produced and therefore the detector will collect less signal and then interpret as the darker image. As you can see from this area, the beauty of scanning electron microscope is that you can see the metal microstructure in 3D. This is the 3D image that we obtained from taking the high chromium white cast iron investigated under the SEM. And these are the drain drive structures in the cast iron. Here is showing the tips of the drain drive and the arms of the drain drive all looking like the full tree and that this tip is pointing towards the solidifying direction. And you can see that we can get a lot of information by just looking at the microstructure of the metallic materials. Next is the ductile cast iron that I already show you the example of the microstructure under the optical microscope. This is the fracture surface of the ductile cast iron and you can see the globular graphite sitting in the microvoid. And by looking on this picture, we can see that by having a lot of graphite nodules, the fracture surface appears ductile and that will consume a lot of energy during fracture. And hence the name, the ductile cast iron, because this type of cast iron produce quite significant amount of ductility. And last one here is the example of metallic form that you can see the porous structure. And for the metallic form is used in the application that weight is critical. For example, 